Hello, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly messages. And today, we are in the middle of a, a sermon series entitled, The Cost of Following. And today's message is entitled, Paying the Ultimate Price. You know, multitude of thousands are multiplied thousands, maybe even millions of Christians across the world and over time have paid the ultimate price as the cost of following Jesus. They did it. They are doing it with joy and without any regret at all. While sadly, we here in the free world, we get comfortable in our padded pews and our hi-fi stereo system and our lackadaisical style worship as we enjoy our lattes before and after service and we never give a thought or about those who are actually paying the cost they, they're, they're paying with their own lives they're paying with the lives of their loved ones their spouses their children I want you to listen to this quote from Richard Warmbrand's book tortured for Christ. He says, I tremble because of the suffering of those persecuted in different lands. I tremble thinking about the eternal destiny of their torturers. I tremble for Western Christians who don't help their persecuted brethren. Jesus did not promise us an easy peasy style lifestyle. He said quite the opposite. He said that, um, that in this world, we will have troubles. Because if they persecuted him, they will persecute us, his followers, his people, his redeemed, his church. Jesus said that Christians will be persecuted and even killed on account of him. And those who kill them will believe that they are offering a service to God. But they are not offering a service to God. In fact, Jesus said that they don't even know the Father, and they don't even know who he is. Can you just imagine that people believe, they think that they are more loved by God because they kill his people. The Christian believers. I want us to go to the scripture found in John chapter 16, verse 1 through 4. And this, this is where, where we'll get, take our message from. This is Jesus describing what unbelievers will do to the believers. John chapter 16, verse 1 through 4. I have said all these things to keep you from, from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you. And when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. There are hundreds, the thousands, the millions. There are the despised, the rejected, the forgotten. There are the persecuted, the imprisoned, the tortured. But still, their faith is strong. Still, they hold on to, to a hope that won't fade or die. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. This is just some of their stories, paying the ultimate price. Every one of Jesus' apostles, with the exception of John, were all martyred for their belief in the risen Savior. A lot of the first century Christians, the believers who either knew Jesus firsthand and knew that he was crucified and rose again on the third day, or were converted by someone who witnessed the whole thing, were either 
severely persecuted or were martyred. Started with Jesus himself, who was crucified to pay the price of sin for the whole world. He paid the price of sin for those who, who, who persecuted him, who tortured him, and who put him to death. He was persecuted by the religious leaders of his day. And they executed him on false charges. Pilate said, we find no sin in him. Herod found no sin in him. Indeed, even Satan, when he came, he found nothing in him. He found no guile in Jesus. You could say that Jesus died a martyr's death. Why? Because this is what the Webster's New World Dictionary and Thesaurus um, defines a martyr as. One, any of those people who choose to suffer or die rather than give up their faith or principles. Jesus came to this world to die for you and for me. For all, anyone, whomsoever thou wilt, let him come. Jesus chose to die. No one took his life. He, was willing, he willingly laid it down for the whole world. He believed. In fact, he knew there was no other way for mankind to be saved except by his own sacrifice. Number two, we're still describing what a martyr is. Any person tortured or killed because of his or her beliefs. Again, Jesus chose to suffer for us by his stripes. We are healed. And the third one, to put to death or torture for adherence to a belief. And again, Jesus was put to death for sins he himself did not commit. Jesus believed, in fact, he knew he was the only son of God, the only begotten son of God, the redeemer who was sent to this old world to pay the price for sin. He suffered and died that we might live. He was raised again to life on the third day and that sealed our promise of sonship and eternal life. Because he lives, we too shall live. Stephen, the first recorded martyr in the New Testament after Jesus, was dragged out of the city and stoned because of his belief in Jesus, a risen Savior. James, the brother of John, was martyred next. According to, to Clemens Alexandrinus, he, he, his accuser, the, the, the one who brought charges against him, um, he, he was so overcome with, with um, James' extraordinary courage and his undauntedness, even in the face of death. He, was, he, he, he had courage. And he was willing to die for his faith. This man who accused him and brought the charges against him came and fell down at his feet and asked for forgiveness for what he had done to James. And then he himself then professed to be a Christian and decided that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. So he too also was behated with John at the same time. This was his accuser. The other ten apostles, including Matthias, who took Judas's place, were also all martyred. And I said ten because, as I mentioned earlier, John was the only one who, did, who died a natural death. Though he was boiled in oil, though he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, he did not actually suffer martyrdom, according to church traditions. The first persecution broke out under Nero, who declared that he wished to see the ruin of all things before he died. 
He was cruel and barbaric. He devised cruel and inhumane punishments for the Christians to fulfill his lust for vicious brutality and in hopes that he would put an end to Christianity. But the persecution only served to increase the spirit of Christianity. The more he persecuted the Christians, the more people believed, the more their, their, their faith increased, and the more Christianity spread. According to, to the Fox's book of martyrs, he had Christians, this is Nero, he had Christians sewed up in, in skins of wild beasts and then had dogs attack these Christians while they were sewed up in these skins, still, still with the blood on them. They, and, and the dogs would attack them again and again and again until they died. He had others dressed in shirts made stiff by wax and had them fixed to axle trees and then he set them on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate his gardens with these burning Christians who refused to recant their love for Jesus. The second great persecution broke out under Emperor Domitian who was naturally inclined to cruelty, it is said of him. He commanded that all the lineage of David be put to death. And a law was made that no Christian, once brought before the tribunal, should be exempt from punishment without renouncing his religion. You had to renounce Jesus. There was no other way. People fabricated tales trying to cause trouble for the Christians during this time. If famine or pestilence or earthquakes afflicted any part of the Roman provinces, it was blamed on the Christians, and the Christians endured it all. Informers, for the sake of gain, had innocent people tried and convicted. They got paid for it. When any Christians were brought before the magistrate, a test oath was proposed. When, if they refused to take it, death was pronounced against them, and they, they confessed themselves Christians, the same sentence, that same death sentence, was carried out. Polycarp. You know Polycarp? A disciple of John, the beloved. He was apprehended and sentenced to death. The proconsul urged Polycarp, and I quote, Swear I will release thee, reproach Christ, end of quote. But Polycarp, and I love this answer. This is a beautiful answer. This is his answer, and I quote, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who hath saved me? End of quote. So because he would not denounce Christ, because he would not renounce his Christianity, his beliefs, his love, they tied Polycarp to a stake and they placed wood all around him. And they set it on fire. And it is said that the flames encircled his body like an arch. And the flames did not touch his body. So the executioner, when he saw this, he ordered the executioner or, or, um, to, to, to pierce him with a sword. And so much blood flowed out of Polycarp that it extinguished the fire. He died a martyr's death. Other Christians were put to death by being stretched and pressed to death by heavy weights. What they would do, they would stretch them out and then they would take these really heavy weights and they would lay them on top of the Christians. And they would put more and more until their bodies were crushed by these heavy weights. 
Others had their brains dashed out by clubs. Whole families, including the mother, was, were, were beheaded with the same sword. They killed husband, wife, and children, all with the same sword, all, all sharing the same blood. Some were thrown to deaths from, to, to their deaths from great heights, while others were burned alive, boiled, or had red-hot brass plates placed upon the tenderest parts of their bodies. Pregnant women were, were murdered. One pregnant woman in particular was stabbed while on the delivery table with a knife. And when she tried to run away, they, they, they chased her down and they caught her in a corn loft. And they took and they threw her off from that great height into the streets. And when she hit, the child came out. They ran over, got the child, stabbed the child and threw the child into the river. They hung both men and women by their hair or their feet and smoked them with hay until they were nearly dead. And if still they refused to sign a recantation, they hung them up again and repeated the process that vicious cruelties all over again. They forced many to yield by using these things and many yielded and recanted. Others suffered and died. Others, they plucked off all of their hair of their heads, their beards with pinchers. Others, they threw into great fires and pulled them out again, repeating it until they extorted a promise to recant. Some, they stripped naked. And after offering them the most infamous insults, according to, to, to the martyr's book of... Um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. They stuck them with pins from head to toe and lanced them with pen knives. And sometimes with red hot pinchers, they dragged them by the nose until they promised to turn. Turn away from their beliefs. Turn away from Jesus. Sometimes they tied fathers and husbands while they ravished their wives and their daughters before their eyes. They made them watch. Multitudes they imprisoned in the most repulsive and disgusting dungeons where they, they were tormented in secret so that nobody even knew the extreme the extremity of the tortures that went on in secret. Their wives and their children, they shut up in monasteries. They devised all sorts of torture chambers and tools and mechanisms to use in the Christians. You may recognize some of these names, but they're, they're all associated with these torture uh, mechanisms. The first one is the Roman candle. I'm sure you heard of the Roman candle. We, we, we have it at fireworks. The Roman candles was, was this. They, they, they took Christians and they soaked them in oil or they soak them in wax or some other flammable substance. And then they set them ablaze for the amusement of, of um, Emperor Nero, the Roman candle. Or here's one. The Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden was a human-sized box fitted with interior spikes used in medieval times to torture Christians. The tortured victims were forced inside and the door was shut, driving these spikes into the eyes and different vital parts or, or vital organs in their bodies. The spikes were just long enough to... to and, and play strategically enough to pierce the body, but not to cause instant death. Instead, the victim would bleed out over time and with excruciating pain. Can you just imagine spikes being driven into your eyes, into your lungs, 
into your kidneys, your liver, your, 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 your private parts. We just left there. Philean. Philean was, was the removal of the victim's skin, exposing nerves and blood vessels, leaving the tortured soul in excruciating and immense pain. The Russians had a, a version of um, this Iron Maiden. And this is how Warm Brand described it. He said, We Christians were sometimes forced to stand inside boxes, wooden boxes, only slightly larger than we were. This left no room to move. Dozens of sharp nails were driven into every side of the box with their razor-sharp points sticking through the wood. While we stood perfectly still, it was all right. But when we were forced to stand, stand in these boxes for endless hours, that's when the troubles began. When we began, began by fatigue and began to sway with tiredness, the nails would pierce our bodies. If we moved or twitched a muscle, there was that horrible, those hor horrible nails. What the communists have done to Christians surpasses any possibility of human understanding. I have seen communists whose faces, while torturing believers, shone with rapturous joy. They cried out while torturing Christians, We are the devil! This was the reality of thousands of Christians then. This is the reality of thousands of Christians now. Christians in communistic and in communist and Islamic and other non-Christian countries know that when they accept Jesus, they will probably have to pay for it with their own lives. They know that for them, paying the ultimate price is a reality. Yet they pay it because it is worth the price. Handcuffs with sharp nails were placed on their wrists that if they stood perfectly still, they were okay. But in the bitterly cold cells that these Christians were held in, their bodies began to tremble from the cold, tearing their wrists to shreds. They hung them upside down with ropes. They severely beat them as their bodies swung back and forth. Listen to what Warmbrand wrote. When Christians in free countries win a soul for Christ, the new believer may become a member of a quietly living church. But when those in captive nations win someone, we know that they may have to go to prison and that their children may become orphans. The joy of having brought someone to Christ is always mixed with this feeling that there is a price that must be paid. That's what we're talking about today. Paying the ultimate price. We want salvation without the suffering. We want all the exclusive promises of God without our separation from the world. We want to fit in. We want to slide in. We want to make it in. Richard Warmbrand said that the tortures he endured were so horrible that he preferred not to talk too much about them because they were too painful. And when he, 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 he did speak, of them, he could not sleep that night. Yet he prayed to the Lord after being released, after enduring all of the suffering, after being freed for, for over a decade of this type of torture. Still, he prayed to the Lord. 
That if there is someone in prison who needs his help to be saved, to send him back to prison, to send him back to that torture, he would endure it for the soul of that lost loved one or that lost person who would be in jail. What am I talking about? Well, Richard Warmbrand says it best. This is what I'm talking about. He says, and I quote, Thus, the underground church worked not only in the secret meetings and clandestine activities, but boldly in the open, proclaiming the gospel on the communist streets and the communist leaders. There was a price, but we were prepared to pay it. And the underground church is still prepared to pay it today. End of quote. What about us? Are we prepared to pay the ultimate price? Are we prepared to win souls for Christ at all cost? Are we still, are we satisfied to sit in our comfortable pews and in our air-conditioned sanctuary and let others pay the price for us? As I said, they know the moment that they accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, they are a target. And there will be a price to pay. But they continue to believe. They continue to encourage one another. They, they continue to win souls for Jesus. As Richard Warmbrand said, there was a price to be paid. But we were prepared to pay it. And the underground church is still prepared to pay it. I want you to understand that it is strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners in communist Romania. As it is still today, strictly forbidden to preach Jesus in communist countries, in non-Christian countries. Richard Warnbrand said, It was understood that whoever was caught doing this preaching received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. The privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. And this was their terms. He said, it was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching and they were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. He said the following scene happened more times than he could remember. A brother was preaching to other prisoners when guards would burst in suddenly and surprise him halfway through a, a phrase. They would haul him down the corridor to their beating room. After what seemed like an endless beating, they would bring him back, throw his bruised and bloody body into the cell, throwing him on the floor, and then he would slowly pick his bruised and battered body up from off the floor. He would dust himself off. He would straighten out his clothes. And he would say, So brethren, where did I leave off before I was interrupted? And he continued the gospel message. They will not be silenced. They would not be silenced. This is the kind of things that they endured and are enduring for the sake of the gospel and the, for the sake of lost souls. A price had to be paid. I want to tell you one last story before I close, if that's okay. Story told by Richard Warmbrand. He said, a pastor by the name of Florescu was tortured with red-hot iron pokers and with knives. He was beaten very badly. Then starving rats were driven into his cell through a large pipe. He could not sleep because he had to defend himself all the time. If he rested for just a moment, the rats would attack him. He was forced to stand two weeks, day and night. 
the communists wished to compel him to bring his brothers or, or to betray his brothers, but he refused. He resisted steadfastly. He would not betray his brethren. Eventually, they went and they got this man's 14-year-old son, and they brought this 14-year-old boy to the prison. And right in front of his father, they began to whip the boy, saying that they would continue to beat him until the pastor said what they wished him to say. They beat the boy so badly that it drove the poor man half mad. He bore it for as long as he could. Then he cried out to his son, and I quote, Alexander, I must say what they want. I can't bear your beating anymore. The, fa the son answered, this is what his fa the son said, Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Withstand. If they kill me, I will die with the words, Jesus and my fatherland. The communist, hearing that, enraged them. And they fell upon this child. And they beat him so severely that his blood was splattered all over the walls, all over the cell. And they beat him to death. But that 14-year-old boy died praising God. Richard Warmbrand says that our dear brother, Florescu, was never the same after seeing that. And who would? It was a price that they had to pay. And they paid it for the love of Jesus. Their reward is great. Because this is indeed paying the ultimate price twice over. Let me quote, close with this quote from Richard Warmbrand. This is what he says. He says, don't just say that this is ugly and immoral. Of course it is. But ask yourself if it is not also your sin that such tragedies occur, that such Christian families are left alone and are not helped by you who are free. My challenge to you today End of quote. My challenge to you today is to pray for the persecuted church. Pray for their well-being. Pray for their boldness. Pray for their success. And support the persecuted church. Give them the tools that they need to win souls for Jesus. Petition your, your, your government leaders to do something. I want to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Do you know the one who died for you, who was beaten for you, who was nailed to the cross for you, who paid the ultimate price for your soul? Do you know him? He's stretching out his hands to you today. He's stretching out his hands to you every day. He's saying, oh sinner, come home because I love you. I died for you. I love you this much. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can. You know, there's a time that's coming and it's soon at hand when Christianity is not going to be free here in the free world. We're fighting, desperately fighting to have Christ stomped out. To have Christianity stomped out. We can't mention his name in schools. We can't take Bibles to schools. It's frowned on. Do you know him? Do you know him before it's too late? Would you accept him today? Pray this prayer with me. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, your son. Thank you for dying on the cross, Lord Jesus. I accept your sacrifice. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your salvation. Wash me now with your blood that I might be clean. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And help me to be bold and confident. Help me to win souls. Lord, that I might not be a lackadaisical Christian, but that I would be on fire for you. That I would pray for my loved ones. That I would pray for the church. That I would pray for the persecuted church. Teach me, Lord, to pray. Thank you now. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I would suggest that you buy yourself a Bible and you read your Bible every day. Get yourself a set of highlighters and highlight the promises that's meaningful to you. And, and pray those promises. Believe in that, that, that the God who, who made those promises hears. And if he hear, he will answer. We believe that he's a good God and that he's coming back for us one day. That where he is, he, there we shall be also and we will be with him forever and ever. No more torture, no more jail, no more prisons, no more being ashamed, no more fear, no more tears. Then I would like to encourage you to, to um, find a church Join a Bible-believing church and, and become active in that church. Let them disciple you. And the Lord Jesus will strengthen you. Well, I just want to encourage you in your walk. And I want to encourage you to remember the persecuted church. And again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We have two more uh, messages left in this series, and then it's, it, uh, it'll be completed. So join us next week for our fifth message. My name's Kenny Yates. This has been Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.